Order members, it's now time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one to the Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The UK Spending Review 2015 will determine the Executive's budget allocation for the five years commencing 1617. The outcome of the spending review will be announced on the 25th of November 2015. I will bring a budget to the Executive and Assembly for consideration after that date. I call Kieran McCarthy for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her, her response. Given the tight, uh, very tight timetables, uh, timings between um, now and the start of the next financial year, how can the Minister ensure that a strategic approach will be adopted that reflects emerging priorities such as investing in skills and indeed gr in growing our economy? Well, I thank the member for his question, and he's put his finger on the problem that faces us in respect of this spending review. Uh, ordinarily, we would put out a draft budget, and we would consult on that draft budget, and that would give us time to listen um, to all of the stakeholders and indeed all of the members here uh, as to how to address strategic priorities. But because of the lateness of this spending review, the 25th of November, uh, we are having to look at different ways to engage uh, with stakeholders, and it's unlikely that we will go through. Uh, the, in fact, we can't go through the process that we normally go through in respect of draft budgets and then confirming the budget. So, I am considering alternative ways of seeking the views of stakeholders to make sure uh, that we do hear all of the voices in relation to what the priorities should be. Uh, in relation to whether it should be a one-year budget or a multi-year budget, obviously uh, I uh, am of the opinion that it should be a one-year budget because we will be entering a new mandate after May of next year and it would not be right uh, to set budgetary priorities without allowing uh, the new executive to, to set those in the uh, new programme for government. So it would be my opinion, of course, it's a matter for the executive as a whole, uh, but it would be my opinion that we will just set a one-year budget. I call Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, and I thank the, the Minister for her answers uh, up until now. Could I ask the Minister um, if she is not to hold a formal consultation on her draft budget, how she will engage with stakeholders? Well, that's what we're considering at this present moment in time. As I've said, the preferable way would be to have the usual 12-week uh, consultation on the draft budget and to allow uh, people, indeed all of the different sectors affected, to come forward and put forward uh, what they believe uh, is the right way uh, to move ahead. But we will have to be more targeted, uh, presumably in different sectors. We will hold events um, to go out and engage with those particular sectors around uh, what we think are the emerging priorities for the budget. Uh, given that we do not have the time, we simply don't have the time to engage in a draft uh, budget process. And I regret that, uh, and indeed I regret the fact that we have not uh, clarity in relation to where Westminster is going in relation to uh, the comprehensive spending review. There hasn't been very much uh, uh, negotiation or uh, uh, meetings in relation uh, to how the devolved institutions are going to be treated in the comprehensive spending review. We've heard a lot uh, about departments in Westminster and how some of them are facing cuts up to 30 per cent, which is just uh, an incredible uh, amount of savings. And uh, Unfortunately, we haven't had much um, engagement uh, with the Treasury or indeed the Chief Secretary of the Treasury in relation to how it's going to impact on the devolved administrations. And that's a frustration uh, that's shared not only uh, with my Welsh colleague but with the, my Scottish colleagues as well. So it's something that we have raised directly in correspondence. I call Gordon Lyons. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister uh, give the House her assessment of the budget envelope for the next five years? We won't know uh, what the budget envelope will be uh, until it's announced by the Chancellor on the 25th of November, but uh, whilst we don't have the exact budget envelope, the uh, economic and fiscal outlook, as published by the Office for Budget Responsibility in July, uh, indicates um, that. Once again, uh, we in Northern Ireland uh, will be largely protected from the worst of the cuts uh, that will come um, to the UK public expenditure. However, uh, we will continue to see a real-term uh, reduction 
uh, until around 2020-2021. That's where the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility thinks that things will start to move in the opposite direction. Uh, but as I say, we'll have more clarity on the 25th of November when we'll be able to look then as to how we're going to be directly impacted. I call Michaela Boyne. Can I ask the Minister what options is the Executive considering, if any, in terms of revenue raising measures ahead of a new programme for government? Well, this is something that uh, hopefully once we have completed the current I use the term current, hopefully the last uh, talks process um, in relation to the, the difficulties that we currently face. Uh, we will then, of course, turn to looking at the programme for government for the next uh, administration and what the outcomes should be around all of that. Uh, and indeed, revenue raising will be uh, something that will uh, be looked at, but of course, it's a very controversial area, uh, and there are many uh, in this House that share with me uh, that some of the revenue raising uh, issues that have been suggested by others uh, are, are simply not something that we would engage in, such as water charging. I mean, we will not, and this party has been very clear uh, in relation to water charging, that we believe it would be a retrograde step, uh, particularly for householders who have been through a very, very difficult time uh, over this past uh, couple of years. However, there is scope to look at other issues, and I think we should look at other issues uh, uh, when we're uh, thinking about the next programme for government. Can I advise members that listed questions number five and six have been withdrawn? I now call Paul Given. Question number two. And with your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will answer questions two, seven, and ten together. I have commissioned a November monitoring round with a view to seeking executive agreement on outstanding budgetary issues in this financial year. Departmental returns submitted as part of the process indicate that significant progress has been made in managing the significant pressures identified early in this financial year. I will update the Assembly in due course once executive agreement on the November monitoring round has been secured. I call Paul Given for a supplementary. The Minister will be aware that critical to the uh, completion of this financial year is the implementation of the Stormont House Agreement. Can the Minister outline the consequences if a deal is not uh, reached in terms of the financial impact to the Northern Ireland Executive's budget? I thank the member for his question. and He will know that the budget for this year for 2015-16 uh, is predicated on the Stormont House Agreement uh, being implemented. So the financial consequences uh, would be significant, if not dire, if the uh, December 2014 Stormont House Agreement was not honoured. Um, there's no realistic way uh, in which uh, we could live within the 2015-16 Dale control total if the uh, Stormont House Agreement uh, flexibilities in particular uh, were not uh, dealt with. The key financial pressures that would bite uh, would be the need to pay 100 million reserve claim for 14-15 uh, and of course uh, the welfare reform costs, both of which would come out of our resource deal. So it is uh, very important that we reach agreement in relation to the Stormont House and that we do so as soon as possible. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Speaker, and furthering uh, question number seven. Uh, the Minister can, Minister, can you advise how with the difficult and very short time remaining, that capital, including conventional and financial transactions, can be utilised uh, before the end of March? And is there a serious risk of money being returned to the Treasury? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the very last part of that. I wonder, could you just the, the bit about Treasury? Will, will there be capital monies returned to the Treasury at the end of March? Certainly, uh, that's not our plan. Uh, in relation uh, to the capital funding. As I've said, um, in June monitoring, there was a significant pressure uh, appearing. Um, very significant monitoring bids were made at that particular time. Uh, I took the decision to write to all departments and to say to them that they needed to stop all discretionary spend. I'm very pleased to say that that uh, had uh, an impact and indeed there is uh, a greatly reduced um, monitoring round now in November, and uh, we are going to be able to deal 
uh, with that, hopefully uh, in the coming days when we will be able to make announcements. Uh, in terms of capital, uh, as he knows, the uh, financial transactions capital, we're hoping to find a home for that uh, in the Northern Ireland Investment Fund so that we don't lose any financial transactions capital. Uh, as regards uh, um, normal capital, if I can call it that, uh, we believe that we have a home for that as well. So we do not foresee any capital being handed back to Treasury. I call Tom Buchanan. Three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, 866 employees left the civil service on the 30th of September. A further 1,540 will leave between the 30th of November and the 31st of January. These exits will deliver a pay bill saving in 2015-16 of 23.6 million and 69.1 million per annum thereafter. The compensation cost will be 68.4 million. Further offers will be made at the end of November for exits at the end of March. I call Tom Buchanan for supplementary. Thank you uh, and thank the Minister for her um, response. Can the Minister advise how the staff uh, are being selected to leave? Well, essentially, um, the selection criteria are being applied in order by department grade, uh, an analogous grade, uh, and by discipline where necessary based on the numbers required by each department to determine uh, those who will exit under the scheme. Uh, the first uh, criteria is best value for money score uh, using the least cost, uh, which is upfront compensation payment, and the maximum payback, the resultant wage savings uh, in a one-year period. And where individuals are tied on that criterion, uh, random selection is used thereafter. And uh, the decision in relation to staff uh, and which staff uh, are to leave has been devolved down to departmental levels uh, and, uh, it, because we felt the departments were best placed to make the decisions uh, in relation to the staff that they needed. I call Ian Milne. Uh, can I ask the Minister, is she confident that the scheme won't be subject to a legal challenge by the unions? Well, as much as one can be confident uh, that it will not be challenged by the unions, uh, yes, we are. We uh, did engage, as you would expect, uh, with our lawyers before the scheme was put in place. Uh, and therefore, the legal basis is very much, uh, we believe, a robust basis. However, that doesn't stop others um, thinking that they may want to challenge or whatever. But I believe we will be able to defend any challenge that is brought. I call Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Um, could, could I ask the Minister to give an assurance that the reduction in personnel won't have a detrimental effect on frontline services, particularly given the level of experienced personnel who are leaving the service or projected to leave the service? Well, I made the point that we had devolved the decision down to departmental level, and that was one of the reasons that we, we did that, because the uh, sheer scale of the exits and the speed with which they, they were needed to be made uh, meant that departments uh, had to be able to make sure that they would maintain service delivery uh, and to do it uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, and therefore, um, we wanted to ensure that essential employees, for example, were exempted uh, from the scheme. Um, and to allow departments to deploy quotas if that was considered necessary. Uh, we didn't allow employees to go all in one tranche. As you know, this has been spread uh, across the year and uh, they are going to be released over four tranches. Uh, and as I say, the employees are released on a departmental basis, so some departments are allowing more to go than other departments. And I know uh, certainly some constituents have been in touch as to why uh, the Department of Social Development are not allowing as many people to go as the Department of Employment and Learning, uh, and that's a departmental uh, decision uh, and one uh, that they believe they can stand over. So uh, it really is a mixture of, of all of those things, uh, but it is about ensuring that departments have resilience after the voluntary exit scheme has finished to make sure that they can continue uh, to deliver and maintain uh, the public service that we expect from them. Sandra Overend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I want to ask the Minister um, that it seems that there are certain grades of civil servants that are not being allowed to leave the service at this time. Um, it's just maybe touched on the reason on, on that. 
Um, could the Minister confirm if, if this is true and if everyone that wants to leave will be allowed to leave at some stage there? Well, as I've indicated, there may be some grades uh, that departments feel uh, are, are necessary to keep the department uh, functioning in the proper fashion, uh, and some of those have been exempted from the scheme. Uh, so each department uh, determined the numbers uh, by grade it needed to release under the scheme to secure the pay bill savings, and then corporate HR and, and my own department acted on those instructions. So offers uh, were made commensurate with the numbers to be released as determined by departments rather than with reference to the total number of applicants uh, within a particular business area or grade. And I know that some uh, staff may be disappointed that they're not being allowed uh, to avail of the voluntary exit scheme, but we have to be uh, mindful of the fact that we have a civil service to run and to maintain, and that the public do uh, expect to have a level of service uh, from their civil service. And uh, uh, I know that some will be disappointed with that, but that's uh, tied in to the voluntary exit scheme. I call Jim Allister. Is the Minister monitoring the impact of the exit scheme on the community background of the civil service composition? And if so, has she any grounds for concern and when will that be revealed to the public? Well, that information uh, will be fed into human resources and then that will come uh, to the civil service board and then they will report on that. I don't have any figures at present in relation to that, uh, but I'm sure the member will uh, monitor that himself and will ask me the question again when I will be able to answer in more detail. Moving on, I call Anna Lowe. Thank you. Question number four, please. The Northern Ireland Law Commission was asked to assess the law of defamation by reference to the 2013 Defamation Act. However, the Commission ceased operations before it had completed the review. I have asked Dr Andrew Scott, who was undertaking the review on behalf of the Commission, to produce a final report, and that report will help to inform future policy direction. I call Anna Lowe. Deputy Speaker, and I'm pleased to hear about the review. I'm sure the Minister is aware that the law uh, in England and Wales has not only, not only helped to ensure free speech, but also uh, deter uh, reckless defamation claims. Can I ask the Minister, are there any specific um, clauses in the bill that she would not be happy uh, that, that she she's had particular objection to? Oh, I have no preconceptions about what should or, or should not be done. Um, Dr Scott is taking an, an independent look uh, at what the needs are here uh, in Northern Ireland. I was disappointed that he, he wasn't able to complete uh, the review under the Law Commission. Um, but, however, we have now asked him to complete that piece of work. Uh, unfortunately, it will have to fit around his teaching commitments, um, uh, but we do hope that he will be able to deliver it uh, in the new year, and I look forward to receiving it uh, and to considering it and looking at his recommendations. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister makes reference to Dr Scott and the Commission who, as should be aware, undertook a consultation. Is she prepared to publish that consultation? Well, as I understand it, um, there was around 32 um, responses to that consultation. I don't think that we should preempt Dr Scott's uh, independent review uh, and therefore I'll not be uh, letting those consultation responses come out until Dr uh, Scott has finished his review and his piece of work. Um, he is a very thorough individual and I, I very much look forward uh, to the work. As I've said, the, the review will have to be fitted around his teaching commitments because he teaches at the London School of Economics. Uh, however, I do hope that the final report uh, will be complete and available uh, in the first months of 2016. I call Alton McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her interesting answer in relation to this matter. Uh, will the Minister, whenever uh, the work done by Dr Scott um, uh, comes into being, uh, will she um, go out to further consultation, or what process will the Minister follow uh, on foot of that report? Well, first of all, the committee will receive uh, a copy of the independent report. 
so they'll be free to comment on that report. Uh, then, as Minister, obviously I'll have decisions to take on the foot of the report. We don't know what those decisions will be until we receive uh, the report. Uh, and then we'll move into, uh, if there are changes to be made, we'll have to move into policy development as to how we make those changes. I don't think it would be right to slavishly follow uh, the Defamation Act of 2013. Obviously, it will inform uh, what we do. Uh, but I do think that we need to wait on the report and then decide how we move forward because, of course, it depends on what's in the report. Moving on, I call Sydney Anderson. Question 8, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The review will uh, re examine all non domestic rating reliefs and their continued relevance. Currently, manufacturing companies in a wide range of sectors uh, benefit from 70 per cent industrial derating if the premises are primarily used for factory purposes and involve the use of manual labour. This relief extends to the food sector. Life sciences companies may also be entitled if there is a production process involved. However, research does not normally qualify for derating. The public consultation paper sets out the case for retaining this support, recognising the importance of Northern Ireland maintaining its competitive position for manufacturing. And can I thank the Minister for, for that response? Can the Minister update the House on how the Executive currently supports the manufacturing sector through race relief? Well, of course, uh, early on, uh, and not in this mandate, but it was the last uh, mandate, we took a decision to keep uh, industrial derating for Northern Ireland, and that does help uh, a lot of our companies right across Northern Ireland. 70% uh, of their bill uh, is uh, given rates relief, and therefore they pay 30% of what they would be paying if they were uh, in uh, England, Wales, or indeed wherever. So we believe that is of great assistance uh, to manufacturing companies right across Northern Ireland, uh, whatever subsector they're in in manufacturing. And uh, as I said in the paper that has been put forward, uh, we will not be changing that. We will be keeping that. Uh, and I know that some people have suggested that this uh, review will lead to the end of industrial derating. That's not the case. And I want to make that very clear today. I call Martin O'Millier. Yeah, I want to thank the Minister, especially her commitment to the industrial derating and keeping that. But in terms of the review and the public consultation, Minister, uh, do, you, do you believe that we will be able to come up with solutions to tackle uh, some of the real problems facing small businesses in our, in our high streets and main streets, and I think in particular of the, the number of empty stores and shops uh, that still really pepper uh, many of the main roads and, and streets in our, in our towns and cities? Well, absolutely, and I know the member took uh, part in a debate that we had recently in relation to uh, small businesses in South Belfast, and I thought that was a very worthwhile uh, and useful debate because it allowed us to set out just what is happening in relation to rates relief and indeed the rating system uh, in that particular constituency. As he will know, uh, the small business rates relief has had a, a very good impact uh, for many uh, businesses across Northern Ireland. Uh, some people would say it doesn't go far enough. Some would want us to change the system. Uh, and indeed, the current small business rates relief system uh, only runs to the end of this financial year. And then we have to uh, decide whether we keep it in its current form or do we engage and do something slightly different uh, in terms of town centres. Uh, and that has been suggested to me. Uh, he will know that the uh, Ulster University Economic Policy Group have suggested that we should look to do something different rather than just continue with the small business rates relief scheme. But that's a decision um, that I will take in conjunction with colleagues in the Department of Social Development and indeed uh, in the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. I've already had a meeting with both of those ministers to see if there's something we could do which would have more of an impact, but certainly Moving into the future, we will continue to, to support small businesses. It's just how we do it, whether it's through the rates uh, system or through another system. I call Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Grateful to the Minister for previous answers, particularly the latest answer. But can the Minister advise at this time whether all the existing rates relief schemes are likely to be extended to 2016-17? No, I can't uh, say that they're all going to be. Uh, there's not much point in us having a review if I was to stand up and say that everything that's there at the moment will continue to be there uh, in 16-17. 
I do think it's important that we reiterate the situation in relation to manufacturing uh, because of the difficult uh, week that manufacturing has just been through with the number of job losses, not taking away, of course, from the fact that uh, whilst last week was a particularly uh, bad week and indeed the week before in relation to manufacturing, that manufacturing is actually on the up uh, in terms of Northern Ireland. If you look at the number of jobs that have came uh, to Northern Ireland and indeed been created in Northern Ireland over this past year. However, I do believe, um, given other pressures, not least energy costs, that we, it is right to keep uh, the derating in respect of manufacturing uh, businesses. Uh, and as I have said, in relation to small business rates relief, that is something that we are looking at, whether uh, we use that £20 million that was set aside for small business rates relief, uh, whether we are better using it in a different way, but that is a discussion that is ongoing. Number nine, please. My department introduced new public contracts regulations in February 2015. Uh, these are intended to facilitate the participation of small and medium-sized businesses, for example, by limiting turnover requirements to twice the contract value. CPD has also worked with the construction industry to simplify the pre-qualification process and reduce the effort needed to tender. SMEs are now winning around 85 per cent of construction contracts. CPT has also published guidance to help small and medium-sized businesses to benefit from subcontracting opportunities. I call Mia McLaughlin for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for her, um, for her answer. Uh, just specifically in relation to procurement and tender, uh, could the Minister maybe outline if she would be minded to look at the Social Value Act that is in place in England? Actually, uh, I held a, a procurement board just last week, and that, that was the subject of the discussion at the procurement board. I received a very helpful um, uh, report uh, from a, a group of people, including SIB, who have been running pilots in relation to social contracts. Uh, and one of the queries now is that whether we go down the route uh, of legislation or whether we take a different route in terms of guidance. And that's a discussion uh, that has really just begun now. Uh, it's something I've asked. Um, uh, an executive, uh, not an executive paper, but an executive memorandum to go out around colleagues to ask them what they feel is the best way forward in relation to this issue. So this is very much an issue that the procurement board is looking at at present. I call Karen McEvitt for supplementary. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the minister uh, what has been done, uh, or could you outline what has been done to remove prohibitive criteria, uh, which prevents companies from winning um, tenders for the first time? Well, CPD have uh, introduced a range of measures to try and increase uh, the number of opportunities for small and medium-sized companies, including those people who uh, are dipping their toe into the, the market maybe for the very first time. Um, so the introduction of a single web-based procurement portal, eTenders NI, uh, that shows all of the public sector procurement opportunities that there are available and it alerts firms uh, to tender opportunities in which they may be interested and allows them to store their profile information for use when completing further tenders. Uh, breaking larger contracts into lots is a very important uh, uh, method of allowing small and medium-sized businesses to come forward on their own behalf. Um, for a while, it seemed the only way that you could uh, obtain a government contract is if you were part of a, a, a big partnership and then you went forward together. But we're breaking larger contracts into lots to allow them to come forward on their own behalf. Uh, as I've said, making sure that the uh, uh, turnover requirements is only to twice the contract value, that again was a big challenge for a lot of small uh, and medium-sized businesses. I came across it indeed in my own constituency. Uh, and setting proportionate minimum standards for experience and financial standing, that's important too because in the past uh, setting uh, standards which were quite rightly being asked for, but when we looked at them we didn't think that they were proportionate uh, to the size of the contract as well. So there's been a whole range of ways in which we've tried to increase the opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses. It's something I feel very strongly about having come from enterprise trade and investment and I take a particular interest in. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number 11, please. The Children's Services Cooperation Bill 2015 states that the Department of Finance and Personnel may, by regulations, make provision for the procedures to be followed on the sharing of resources or pooling of funds. 
Such regulations will be used to ensure that the handling of shared resources or pooled funds complies with DFP public expenditure and financial management guidance. Accountability and governance issues will also be addressed. Subject to the Bill receiving royal assent, DFP will work with OFMDFM and other stakeholders to draft such regulations. Members, that ends the period for listed questions, and we now must move on to topical questions, where we have 15 minutes. And I call uh, Rosaline McCorley. Um, and, uh, thank you, um, Mr. De Mr. Deputy Speaker. Because um, on Diglom year or an era, could it impact the our position in Marial or and tourist essential at Nua? Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, what will the implications be for the departmental budget um, according to the uh, new minimum wage? Well, um, I'm not sure that the new minimum wage will have a, a big impact in relation to departmental budget. Certainly, the living wage, when it comes in, will have a particular impact, particularly for uh, the Department of Health and Social Services, because there are a lot of uh, our care workers, for example, who are currently in and around the minimum wage. Uh, when they move up to the living wage, obviously that's going to be more expensive uh, for the departments and uh, that will have to be taken into account when we are settling their budgets. I call Rosalie McCorley for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. And can I ask the Minister uh, what challenges um, does this pose for uh, arms length bodies and for community organisations? And what can government uh, do to uh, support those groups? I think what we must do is to be aware of the scale uh, of the issue. And I have recently been contacted by some of the groups involved in the social care sector to say that it is going to have uh, a big impact on them. I know uh, from the tourism and hospitality sector that they are going to have uh, a big challenge as well. So whilst uh, we all welcome the fact uh, that we were moving to a living wage uh, economy, uh, we should be aware that there are challenges associated with that, uh, particularly for the lower paid sectors. And, uh, uh, whilst the bigger employers will be able to absorb uh, in the private sector, uh, for the public sector it will be a challenge for us. I call Dougie Mackay. Can I, ask, can I ask the Minister if she would take up the case uh, of a Mr William Owens of Brishane, uh, who worked for the Fisheries Conservation Board during the 80s, but even though he has evidence of his membership of a FCB pension scheme in 87, he has been denied his pension payable to 64 that other members of that scheme received. Will the Minister help Mr Owens and other people in that position get the four years pension that they have been unjustly denied? I thank the member for his question. Um, I am aware of the individual that he has uh, brought before the House this afternoon. Indeed, um, my colleagues have written to me uh, around this issue, and indeed, Mr. Owens has written to me directly around the issue. Uh, it's currently been investigated by the department. Uh, I know he may be a bit frustrated about the length of time it's taken uh, to look into this matter, but it is currently being looked at by the department. I call back in the for supplementary. Or yes, many members of this House will be aware of Mr Owens' case and his campaign and canvas for many years on this particular matter. Would the Minister be willing to meet with Mr Owens to try and move this matter on further? Well, what I'm certainly prepared to do is to come back to you and indeed the other members who have written to me around this matter once the Department has finished their investigations to see just where this is at at present. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware that by far the majority of people recruited into the civil service are done so at the level of AA and AO. Um, would she undertake to keep uh, monitoring and keep under review the breakdown and community balance of those employees coming into the civil service? Well, absolutely. And uh, I know it's a matter which concerns the member uh, greatly, and it's something that I will. Um, uh, communicate with him once uh, I've had a chance to look at those figures again for this year, um, and we will uh, certainly look at whether there is a need uh, for intervention uh, in some way in relation to the recruitment of AOs and AAs. I call Gregory Campbell for something. Thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that um, some considerable number of years ago there certainly was a concern because there 
was too few Protestant uh, employees uh, in the uh, much larger section of the civil service than any of the other sections. Um, and hopefully she will be able to keep that matter under review and then, if it is required, uh, adopt a policy that other public sector bodies have had to adopt, which is of intervention to ensure there is equitable treatment across the communities. Well, absolutely, and I am aware that some arm's length bodies have had to adopt that process, but unfortunately it has not had uh, uh, as much of an impact as I would have liked because uh, in the particular circumstance I'm thinking of, uh, that uh, organisation was capped at 49 employees and therefore there was little room uh, for uh, movement in relation to that matter. But I take the member's point and will certainly keep it under review. I call Michaela Bowen. Margaret, uh, can I ask the Minister if she has given any thought uh, to how under the rates re review we might bring in some changes which would help bring more businesses into empty stores across our towns and cities? Go ahead. Well, and indeed, she would be aware that we already have a provision uh, that if someone moves into an empty shop that they are able to avail of rates relief uh, for a limited period of time. I accept it's a limited period of time, but it does help uh, when someone is starting up uh, a new business, and I know of businesses that have really appreciated that uh, in my own constituency. But again, the uh, non-domestic uh, review has only started. Um, the review runs, I think, to the middle of January, so I am hoping uh, that a number of members will come forward and indeed stakeholders will come forward with new and innovative ideas, uh, not just around rate relief, uh, but all of the other areas as well. I call Michaela Boyle. I thank the Minister for her uh, answer to the question. And Minister, would you ever consider specifying certain geographical areas, uh, for example, say a street in a town centre uh, where a special rates exemption would apply to empty stores? And again, I think that's uh, the kind of thing that we need to be thinking about. Um, I, I mentioned the small business rates release scheme, and, and indeed some. Um, town centre organisations believe that instead of just having a, a generalised small business rates release scheme, we should actually target it to the area in the town centre which at present is having difficulty, frankly, filling those spaces uh, because of the level of rates um, that have been levied on the different shops. One of the areas also that has been raised with me, uh, and this is a controversial area, is in, in the realm of charity shops. And, uh, uh, since the review went out, I've already had a number of charities in, in contact with me worried about the fact uh, that they're not going to be able to avail of rates relief. However, on the other hand, I then have small businesses come to me and say, well, they're not paying any rates. I'm next door and I'm paying full rates. Uh, so those are the difficult decisions that we are going to have to grapple with. But we can, we can and we should look at doing things differently. We shouldn't just be driven by what everybody else is doing. And if there is a a challenge uh, in relation to town centres, and some of our town centres, frankly, are struggling, then we should look at those and see if they can make a difference. I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can the, the Minister indicate what progress has been made in relation to the uh, rate relief for sports clubs since the private members' bill failed to pass? Uh, well, the bill that I intend to bring forward uh, is going to contain an enabling power that will permit enhanced rate relief for sports clubs uh, subject to uh, conditions and my current intention would be uh, to use the power to permit enhanced relief of 100 per cent for those community amateur sports clubs that do not have a permanent liquor license and that deals with the competition issue with hotels uh, and pubs and clubs uh, and so it would all align them uh, with the rating treatment of community halls legislation rather than um, putting them into competition uh, with pubs and clubs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, and myself and some of my colleagues met with the Northern Ireland Federation of Clubs, and, and they expressed some disappointment with the lack of consultation that the, on the previous process. Can the minister ensure that, that the likes of those people will have the opportunity to, to fully engage in the, any a new process? Well, absolutely, and, and I hope uh, that they will understand, because of the shortness of time that we have available to us, uh, that it will be a, a targeted consultation rather than the full. 12 weeks of consultation, but I am hoping to go to, indeed I am going, God willing, to the committee uh, tomorrow morning to talk about 
uh, my proposals, and it will be a matter for the committee as to whether they uh, grant accelerated passage. If they do grant accelerated passage, then we can get this bill through. If they decide against it, then it will be a matter probably for the next mandate, and I will regret that. But, however, uh, it is a matter for the committee. Joe Byrne is not in his place. I call Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the uh, case involving my constituent, Amanda Jackson, who was subject to a £77,000 fraud being perpetrated against her. Can the Minister outline, uh, both to the public and all of the professional organisations involved in this uh, transaction, the need to be vigilant and the need to ensure that uh, robust systems are in place for this type of fraud to be prevented from happening in the future? Yes, I am uh, aware of your constituents' case um, publicly, of course, it was uh, raised, but also uh, I know that you did correspond with me uh, in relation to the matter. Uh, I suppose it really is a matter for my colleague, the Enterprise Minister, in relation to uh, trading standards and making sure that everything is in place, but I would uh, urge uh, vigilance in relation to uh, the issue that was brought to my attention, obviously, uh, because there was an awful lot of money in that case, but you know, small amounts of money in other cases mean a big lot to those individuals who have been defrauded. So we should be alert and we should be aware of the dangers online. Can I thank the Minister for that response and indeed in her written correspondence undertaking to write to the Law Society in respect of this issue and the oversight of uh, the legal profession in respect of this case. Uh, of particular concern is that Barclays, who I have corresponded with along with the Member of Parliament, um, through electronic transfers do not check the name of accounts, and this is something that is prevalent across all electronic transactions. Um, uh, is this something that the Minister uh, could undertake to correspond with the banking institutions in respect of this, both from Danske Bank, who were the uh, organisation that let the money out, and Barclays that allowed the money to be received into ultimately what was a fraudulent account that was set up in their organisation? I'm, I'm more than happy if the member wishes to give me the full details uh, of that particular side of it. I did undertake to write to the Law Society because it caused me a great deal of concern in relation uh, to that end of it. But in relation to the banking issue, as he knows, we don't have any control over the banking systems here uh, in Northern Ireland. That falls to the Westminster Government. But I am more than happy uh, to correspond uh, with those banks in relation to this instance. I mean, Thousands of people, millions of people probably every day um, transact um, their banking online and we shouldn't forget that that is uh, the way in which people choose to do their business nowadays and 99% of it is carried out in a very safe manner. Uh, but if there are instances where there are difficulties and clearly this is a case where something went fundamentally wrong, uh, then we should raise it uh, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. I call Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, as the Finance Minister, she will be aware of the dire position uh, in relation to the ever growing waiting lists for patients in our health service. Is the Minister willing and indeed able to invest further and help to enable patients to be seen in a more reasonable time, bearing in mind that a request did go into her department uh, during the June monitoring round for £45 million to assist? Is she able and willing to invest further? Of course, in the 15-16 budget, I and my executive colleagues demonstrated our commitment to improving health and social care by protecting uh, frontline health and social care from the budgetary reductions. That's the first thing I would say. Uh, further, some 200 million of additional funding was provided for the department for frontline health and social care, and it's, I'm glad my colleague is here to hear all of this uh, great funding that has been provided to him by the Department of Finance. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the deterioration in waiting times is due to a number of factors, um, uh, increasing pressures, uh, placing increasing pressures on our health service, uh, demographic changes, which I've talked about in this house before, ageing population, and increasing demand for healthcare interventions. However, all of that has been made worse by the fact that we've been incurring fines in relation to welfare, which otherwise could have went uh, to the Department of Health. I make no apology for saying that. I hope we are able to find a solution to the difficulties that we found ourselves in relation to welfare so that money can be allocated to the Department of Health to deal with those issues. I call Kieran McCarthy. 
Minister for her response. Uh, again, she will remember that a former finance minister criticised a former health minister for not providing value for money. Uh, can the present finance minister assure this assembly that the present health minister will indeed deliver a better service for all of our people, and particularly in waiting lists that we've just been talking about? He's saying I have every confidence. Uh, I do have every confidence in my colleague, the Minister for Health, in relation to this issue. But look, I think the, the key to all of this is to making sure that after the talks have finished, and we hope those talks will finish very soon and we will have an agreement in place, that we can then move to a sustainable budget position where we can allocate the appropriate amount of money to the Department of Health uh, and then that we are able to deal with those waiting lists which have accumulated and which are unacceptable. And I think we all accept that. But we are where we are. Now we have to deal with the issue. Uh, and I look forward to being able to making uh, a statement in relation to November monitoring in the next number of days. And that is the end of our period of time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel.